Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining uh, the Ato Fridays. Our speaker today is Professor Jens Bigert from ICFO Barcelona. He received his PhD in 2001 with distinction from the Technical University in Munich. And his work was awarded the Allen Prize of the Optical Society. And after that, he went on to head a research group on ultrafast pulse generation and strong field physics during his habilitation at ETH Zurich from 2001 until 2006. And since 2007, he has been a tenured professor at ICFO, Barcelona, great place. Uh, it's amazing, amazing uh, from the professional and also personal play, uh, point of view. And he's also an ICREA professor of auto science and ultrafast optics. His research focus lies on the investigation of the real-time quantum dynamics of electrons and nuclei in atoms, molecules, and solids. And he's actively involved in the scientific community as well. And he is an author of the white book leading to the Pan-European Extreme Light Infrastructure, ELI. He is elected chair of the General Assembly of Laser Lab Europe member of the management board of Laser Lab Europe ASBL, chair of the board meetings and member of the meeting council of the Optical Society. And he's also a traveling lecturer uh, of the Optical Society, holds several appointments as adjunct professor at the University of New Mexico in the US and the guest professor of, at the Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society in Berlin, which is also an amazing place. He is associate editor of APL Photonics, of Ultrafast Science, and has received the Thousand Talent Program Award from the government of China. He's a fellow of the German Academic Scholarship Foundation, of the Optical Society of America, and fellow of uh, the American Physical Society, lots of fellowships. And he currently holds an ERC advanced grant, coordinates uh, an FAT consortium, and was awarded the best prize of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. So he has lots and lots of prizes. He's gonna talk about solids in strong fields, which is also all the rage. There's a lot of activity on solids. And we are very happy to have him here today. He is also involved in the Quantum Battles organization, if you don't know. So, um, Today, he will talk about energy conversion pathways in solids from attosecond soft X-ray spectroscopy. Okay, Jens, so you're ready to go. Feel free to start, and we're looking forward to your talk. So thank you very much. And if, if, if I would have known you would read the whole CV, I would have sent you just two lines or something. So thank you very much. It's certainly a pleasure to, to be invited, and I feel very honored. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you, so uh, Carla, Cornelia, and Abby for the great work that you're doing in general with this. I think it's, I think it's a great initiative, so thank you for that. Um, maybe let me start sharing my screen and, and walk you then through the, through the talk. Um, can, you, can you see the presentation layout? Absolutely, all fine. Okay, very good. So, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what, what I'm currently excited about or what we're trying to do in, in Barcelona on um, well using attosecond technology actually um, for the solid state for condensed phase. And, and, um, and uh, so I will walk you a little bit through some of the uh, methodology, what you need to do this, and then uh, some currently um, unpublished results that I'm very excited about and, and the title page uh, tries to illustrate it a little bit. So it's the interaction between uh, some light field that generates a non-equilibrium condition by exciting some material, and then trying to find out where this excitational energy goes as function of time and as function of, um, you know, between the different subsystems that you have, for example, carriers, electron holes, um, um, and the lattice. So before I do this, let, let me motivate a little bit of that, uh, be, because I think it's important to see, at least for, for us or, um, in Barcelona and my group, why we are trying to do that. Whether we achieve all of this is a different story, but at least some of the motivation. So I'll give you four quick examples. 
One is obvious in energy harvesting solar cells, right? So um, organic um, materials for this are fantastic because they are cheap to make. Um, problem in essence uh, is that the efficiencies are not very high, 15, maybe 18% nowadays. So this deals with ex, um, exciton physics. And I hope you can, can you see my cursor actually? I hope so. Um, this is the example of a subtalocyanine chlorine uh, material. And in, in a nutshell, light gets absorbed at the antenna complex at the chlorine atom. You generate electron hole pairs that are tightly bound in this case, uh, so Frankel excitons. And um, somehow you want to understand at the end, you want to uh, um, store some current um, in, in some batteries and you want to understand is the absorption a bottleneck, why you're not above 15, 18%. Is, is a uh, transport problems and so on. So it would be nice, of course, if one could see this. Um, and of course, a gazillion methods are being employed to attack these problems. But by the fact that we haven't um, achieved anything better yet, it's not because people are doing a bad job, it's simply because the problem is complicated. And it might not be enough to just look at what happens at the chlorine atom, and then you don't know how the different um, interactions um, evolve over time, or just to look at some current, for example, at the electrodes. You might want to have a more a bigger overview, and I get back to that. Another big problem is, of course, chemical functionalization. Um, this is about um, paths of likelihood for uh, chemical reaction processes. And as you know, of course, in photochemistry, we are always very good in breaking bonds, but it's very difficult to actually uh, make um, bonds, form them, and uh, steer reactions in a certain uh, direction. However, it's an important problem if you consider that 20% of the global energy consumption actually is used for, for, for chemical industry for these processes. So it would, it's, of course, a very um, important problem. A similarly important problem, electronic transport. If, if you um, consider that, um, for example, um, most of the energy transport or electronic transport actually goes into heat. And if you uh, look at the projected growth of consumer electronics and, and information processing on the internet, um, it's predicted to rise uh, to more than 20% of the global energy uh, consumption in 2030. And this rise is much bigger than um, the projected growth in available um, energy for these purposes. So we certainly will have a problem and we have to find ways um, to, to make these devices more efficient. So in a nutshell, it means uh, looking at how to mitigate dissipation, uh, carrier scattering, um, maybe looking at topological materials and so on. And then fourth example is, um, of course, you're aware of these, uh, for example, mimicking superconductivity by uh, topology, for example, this magic angle graphene, which, of course, uh, science lives from serendipity, but it would be very nice if one had a systematic approach to engineer materials with, with certain properties. And of course, we are, we are here because we believe that light science might provide maybe not just a solution, but at least some ways to address this. So what's at the bottom of all of these things that I've, that I've just um, uh, highlighted? Well, it's in principle simple, in reality complicated. It's the interaction between light fields, phonons, um, that couple to electrons or holes or form um, quasi-particles thereof, excitons. There might be some very fast dynamics. There is coupling, of course, to nuclei or to the lattice. Um, and of course, you have also spins uh, that are important. And typically, we categorize them with different time scales, and I have written them down here. However, um, the problem is that existing characterization methods struggle actually to identify a lot of these actors or all of this together. And why is that? Well, it's because it's not as simple as saying in, in many of the interesting cases that electrons move fast. So we look at them with uh, attosecond or femtosecond pulses. Uh, lattice motion is in general slow. I mean, are, these, these things are correlated um, and uh, there are emergent properties that come out of these correlations. So um, one problem is time overlapping dynamics and I will show you one example of that actually in our measurement. So we cannot rely always, and in most interesting cases, we cannot rely at all on separability like a Born-Oppenheimer-like approximation like in, in chemistry. 
And then if you try to address this with different methods, for example, you use um, photo emission for looking at electronic dynamics or occupation, or you use Raman spectroscopy to look at lattices also. The problem is it's very difficult many times to do these experiments uh, with different um, techniques under identical conditions. Um, and this I just said already, I mean, if you think a little bit more on, on the basic principles, of course, you have the emergence of um, properties from the correlated interaction between these, these players. So how can we use uh, auto second science for that? And I, I don't want to dwell too much on it, uh, but just in a nutshell, of course, um, in order to address these things, uh, let me start by um, saying what the methodology is and how, how we generate these lights. So this is basically um, depiction of the ground state, um, P state of an atom, uh, let's say um, neon or something like this. And what happens when you apply electric field, um, you will, um, if the field strength is large enough, you, you displace the um, electronic density, you induce a dipole. If the field is strong enough, you might even photo emit. Since you have a time oscillating field, which is indicated like this uh, in the snapshot picture at a later time, you, you might have scattering, rescattering of this um, electronic wave packet. And there is a small but non-zero probability, of course, for recombination, and that will lead to emission of light. Um, in these three-step models that, that we use all the time, it's, it's just explained here, right? The field-free case that you know from your textbook. And if you apply a strong enough field, um, you can uh, emit this electron wave packet or eject a classical electron. And the important metric here is the ponder mode of energy. The only point I'm trying to make here is that this process is governed by the intensity of the laser field with which you drive this process and the wavelength squared. And that's, of course, important for what we try to do. And the recollision or the rescattering leads to photons with uh, photon energy of around 3.2 times the ponder mode of energy. And you can get much higher kinetic energy electrons uh, that we are also using for electron scattering. I'm not going to talk about this. Why is it higher? Because you can have twice the momentum transfer. In a nutshell, why is this interesting? Well, we use these processes because it allows us to make short bursts of electron or photon pulses. Why is it challenging is equally obvious because uh, you move um, charged particles with an electric field of a laser pulse. So you need to control this extremely well. Otherwise, the outcome of this process is different every single time. And as I already alluded to, the recombination process, for example, is not very efficient. Therefore, in order to still be able to use this as a viable light source, you need high average power light sources. Um, the method that we're then using if we make um, XUV or soft X-ray light is um, X-ray spectroscopy. This is extremely well established in, in many light sources, not only in a synchrotron. I show you here a beautiful picture of ALBA, which is uh, actually behind the mountain here in Barcelona. It's, 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 it's um, nice uh, synchrotron light source with some picture inside, but you can also have this on the tabletop with uh, plasma-based sources. Um, X-ray spectroscopy is extremely powerful uh, because it's element specific. As I said, it's typically done in user facilities which carry a price tag of maybe a couple hundred million euros. Um, more important for the science that I'm gonna talk about, uh, they don't provide uh, sufficient time resolution. Uh, maybe 100, 150 femtoseconds with slicing sources, typically more in the in the picosecond range or hundreds of picoseconds. So what's, what's the mechanism of X-ray spectroscopy? I give you here the electron um, level scheme of, of carbon, which has six electrons. So the 2p shell is not uh, completely filled. Um, how does it work? If I want to understand the electronic structure and occupation, for example, of a, of a single carbon atom, what I can do is I tune, I go to such a facility, I tune my X-ray light, and at some point, um, when I, when I hit a resonance, for example, when I um, promote a 1s electron, for example, to the 2p state, some photons get absorbed and I register this as absorbance. Okay, so where these peaks are directly gives me information about the electronic structure of not fully occupied states. Um, if I further crank up the photon energy, at some point I kick out my electron, I photoionize, I get a big change in absorbance. 
And if I don't have a single um, atom, an isolated one, but I have a molecule or I'm, I have neighboring atoms in some arrangement, doesn't have to be crystalline, this modifies actually the, the absorption cross-section and manifests as oscillations here as function of energy. And uh, the X-ray community um, has given this some terms, X-ray absorption near edge structure, extended X-ray absorption fine structure, just to say um, that they have spent decades um, to use these techniques to read out electronic structure, excitation, bonding, oxidation, spin state, and so on, or you can actually get nearest neighbor information, um, measure lattice vibration. Of course, not really time resolved. And we showed that actually with the single attosecond pulse, which comes typically with the penalty of having an extremely broad spectrum, you can use this to your advantage here to not scan and cover this whole photon energy range at once. Um, there is a caveat uh, with high harmonic generation with the three-step process I explained to you that um, we, we cannot reach uh, at present really, let's say, 10 kilo electron volts or somewhere else. So if we now look at which elements are nicely accessible in the um, periodic table, I highlighted the ones that we think um, are nicely accessible and um, I don't want to go too much into detail, but if you want to do the X-ray spectroscopy as they do it um, in synchrotron light sources, or typically to get unambiguous measurements, it's very advantageous to go to K uh, transitions or L transitions um, in order to link the measured uh, photon uh, absorption spectrum to the electronic dynamics. I mean, that's, that's the challenge here. Nevertheless, we can cover a lot of interesting elements or um, at least spectators in, in elements or materials. Uh, just maybe a quick word about harmonic generation. You have seen this probably. This is, um, shows you um, how the photon energy that you can generate scales basically with laser wavelengths. And um, it has turned out that if you turn the wavelengths knob, basically that you don't use just high sapphire uh, lasers, which were the most advanced technologies maybe 10 years ago. And you develop new laser sources, which we have done and many others people actually quite actively, you can reach the soft X-ray water window, which is interesting because you can reach the principal absorption edges of carbon, nitrogen, and of course also oxygen. Um, it's nice because um, the other second uh, community has shown and spent a lot of time finding out that it provides full spatial temporal coherence, polarization control. You can make very short after second um, pulses and uh, you have the advantage of full optical synchronization. So you can really go into this uh, after second to femtosecond dynamics. Um, just a few more slides on this. So for us, um, the main system that we're using is, is still a two micron system. It's a Thai Sapphire pumped OPA, which delivers sub two cycle pulses at one kilohertz CP stable. Just some beautiful pictures. This is basically an OPA. And in order to make the pulses short, you have to do some nonlinear optics tricks. Um, I just like to show them because I, I love to see this. You know, um, this is a holo gas filled holocore fiber, which allows you to um, generate uh, short pulses like the one measured here at sufficient energy to reach actually nearly 10 to the 15 uh, watts per square centimeter. Very important is uh, good uh, carrier to envelope phase stability. This is this electric field reproducibility. So you get reproducible upper second pulses and reproducible spectra. And we can keep this stable over several days with sufficient uh, parameters. Um, in essence, the measurement looks simple. I mean, or the generation of the soft X-rays. One of the issues was um, to mitigate electron wave packet diffusion. If you drive this with longer wavelengths, the process gets a lot less efficient. You can mitigate this by using high pressure gases. In a nutshell, you focus your short laser pulse into an interaction um, target where you put, um, for example, neon or, or helium, and out come, um, comes your XUV or soft X-ray radiation that is then analyzed with a spectrometer. In the lab, it looks spectacular because we're using high pressures. Typically, uh, people use 100 millibar, maybe 200 millibar. Here we're going up to 10, 12 bar, as I will show you. And that means that the gas actually, so the laser comes in from the left, drills a hole through this little uh, tube target, which is plugged on top, filled with gas, and the gas streams out left and right, and the X-rays move to the right to the experiment. If you do this with neon and you uh, tune the pressure, you see that we can nicely uh, cover the uh, carbon edge. This was the first demonstration of that. 
And if you go to helium, you can cover the whole soft X-ray range, uh, even to the oxygen edge. This is a linear scale, by the way. Um, and we should have probably published this. This was in a thesis of my one of my people, of course. If you just integrate on the spectrometer, you see that we can actually go even comfortably with a little blip here above 600 dB, but certainly um, across the oxygen edge. But still, for time-resolved experiments, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, flux here at the oxygen edge, and we have worked a lot uh, to improve flux uh, for these measurements. So we're using helium at uh, 10, 12 bar. This is a picture of the lab. And um, this is the current spectrum, uh, some that we use. And indeed, if you put in a carbon foil, you basically measure in, in transmission. You, take, um, you then take the spectrum, how it is changed when you in, uh, move a foil in there, for example, 100 nanometer thick, and you see immediately an absorption from carbon or from titanium. And uh, the spectral stability is much better than a percent over 14 hours. We measured that. We measured also the brilliance, which is actually com completely comparable to uh, the brightest synchrotron slicing source. However, we have actually sub femtosecond, actually around 165 atom second duration in a single pulse. So let me now get to the experiments after telling you about uh, sources and, um, and the methodology. And the first experiment that we had done um, a few years ago is uh, going to graphite to, to go to the carbon edge and first just uh, done a static spectrum. So this is basically an experiment where um, you send this single attosecond pulse, but you don't pump, you just probe and you measure the spectrum. And I show you here uh, the whole spectrum that we have. Actually, this variation is just the variance of the spectrum. It's not noise. And uh, you can analyze uh, this near edge structure, for example. We did that. And in order to test uh, the whole methodology, um, we also went to the synchrotron and measured it there. And you see the comparison, uh, which is excellent. Uh, you also see that uh, we need to spend more money on a spectrometer. So the synchrotron uh, spectrometer resolution is, is a little bit better, but this, this can be fixed. But you see, um, we're measuring exactly uh, the comparable thing, which was very, um, very satisfying. Uh, we can also describe this with theory very well. Um, this is a code um, uh, written by Yves Choly. Uh, he is in Grenoble, it's called FDMNES, uh, which also takes into account, for example, the, the temperature of the lattice because we're measuring at room temperature and you see that it describes the whole features extremely well. So it gives really confidence to extracting information from this. Uh, when you analyze this um, extended edge structure, exactly with the same software packages and methodology that X-ray people do, you get these uh, Fourier peaks, the Fourier amplitudes, um, and out of that, uh, you can extract exactly the, the nearest neighbor distance. So you know in Angstrom um, how far away the, the nearest uh, neighbor nuclei are, here just the carbon atoms, and it matches actually very well with what's in the literature. So it shows you um, proof of principle that the attosecond technology and single pulses can be used to extract all that information at once. Now let's get to the uh, real uh, time uh, measurements in graphite. And you might wonder why graphite? Um, well, so let me say a few words about it. So graphite um, is basically a fund of ours bonded uh, graphene layers as shown here with, with the dimensions that I show. And I also show you some of the binding orbitals, so basically some linear orbitals um, that are relevant here. Graphite is, um, the properties are extremely anisotropic, much alike graphene. So it behaves very much like if you were looking at graphene. It has extremely high carrier mobility, as you know. And in fact, it has, um, it's very challenging for measurements, um, contrary to what you might think, because it exhibits dynamics on essentially all time scales due to this high carry mobility, strong coupling uh, to lattice vibration. So it's a, it's a very hard test case to see if we can really follow this, uh, the whole excitation and de-excitation of the different subsystems. Also graphite together with silicon carbide is, um, as you might probably know, um, one of the most used um, materials and batteries. And for example, one of the issues why your lithium ion battery uh, reduces its efficiency after some time because of intercalation and, and ion movement and uh, processes not being reversible. So it's, of course, we haven't measured the battery directly, but it's still an interesting material to look at for these reasons. 
And despite all the investigations, there exist actually quite a few open questions on it. And a fundamental one is, what is exactly the carrier scattering dynamics? Think about my solar cell example um, that I'm telling you about. And another one is related to how, do my, how does my electronic excitation actually um, reduce and how does it couple to the, to the phonon buff? So what are the phonon excitation pathways? And there are two main pathways that are being discussed. Uh, just in a nutshell, so um, carbon, as you see, has uh, six-fold symmetry. And if I go to the Brion cell, I show you these, well, basically the, uh, the K position of, of, um, of the neighboring um, uh, centers. And so you have two strongly coupled optical phonons that are responsible for the D excitation. And in fact, um, lattice motion is, is your main source for one over F noise. So it's important to understand where the energy goes. And one is basically intra um, valley scattering, which is this E to G um, strongly coupled optical phonon. Therefore, this should happen very quickly. And the other one actually is uh, inter valley scattering and therefore it should take longer time. And, uh, and the processes that are being discussed is, okay, is it Raman, um, one is Raman active and, and one should actually occur from a, from a displacive motion. It's, it's a bit like your Frank Condon uh, factor that you have in chemistry. So let's see if we can address this. What I show you here is uh, the calculated band structure, momentum resolved for, for graphite. Um, and the different colors give you the momentum character. Um, so you'll see in a second why this is important. And if you then uh, calculate the density of states at room temperature, this is what you get. Now, um, you can identify the different states here. Um, uh, down here, pi is, is basically the, um, is the valence band and pi star and, and higher are the conduction bands. So pi star is an, is an antibonding state. And um, it relates to these kind of peaks in the density of states. Uh, they, they are there because of the Van Hove singularity. And now you can, you can identify them because you can say, okay, these, these are actually PZ character. So this means that um, this pi star state um, that relates to this peak and the density of state is related to the PZ orbital, which sticks um, well, along the Basel plane normal. And uh, so if I record any changes there, it's probably because um, the, the interlayer separation is changing. If I look at the sigma star up here, you see this is a hybridized orbital, right? This is the binding orbital here in plane. And so if you have an in-plane in lattice motion, you should register this on, on the sigma star up here. Okay, so the first measurement we did was no pump still, just, just a probe from the 1S state, which is bound by 284 EV. And it's a K transition, so there is no ambiguity. Uh, S to P is allowed. And let's see how it matches. It matches perfectly. This is exactly what I said, and this is known for a long time in the X-ray field, that if you do this uh, transition, no ambiguity, you can directly read out the density of states, basically. So now we can um, start pumping the material, generating a non-equilibrium condition and following the dynamics. So this is uh, one of the measurements. We did quite a few at uh, different fluents. So the pump here, for the one I show you, this is the strongest uh, pump fluence. Um, it's very high, but it's uh, comparable to what people use uh, that do Raman spectroscopy on, 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 on phonon dynamics. It's a uh, two micron, 1.8 micron light uh, sub two cycle uh, CP stable. And we probe with this single up to second pulse with a spectrum from two to 500 dB. Um, and what I show you is the differential absorption. So this means pumped minus unpumped. So the Delta A and what you see is um, I show you just a small energy range around the uh, Fermi energy here over um, a large delay uh, range scan up to picoseconds. And you see um, red and blue features which relate to uh, positive and negative changes in the absorption, actually very large changes, um, larger than 10%. So now we can identify them with uh, the graph that I showed you before as related to the pi and pi star and sigma star features here. I also just indicate the duration of the pump pulse and its spectrum. So you see there is of course um, a lot of um, influence from the, from the very strong field that you have here. And um, we can apply procedures that take into account um, for example, band filling and, and start shifting in, all, in order to clean this up and then analyze the information. So we can clearly see 
um, up there that um, some where we don't pump um, that there are still signatures that are probably related to lattice motion and as I tell you later that indeed it's like that we see and can infer photodoping at the vicinity of the K point this is where these um, where the conduction and valence band meets even for very low fluences this is comparable to electron spectroscopy and as I just said this broadening and splitting happens because in this case of the very very high uh, carrier concentration if we simply take line outs um, along, um, along time for certain energy, we can look at the temporal dynamics, right? So you see the rise and the fall time. And the nice thing here is that we have basically electrons and holes and higher lying states together. Um, if we just look at the incoherent background, so we ignore these oscillations that we really measure, uh, we get um, the different rise and decay times out here. And you see that by exponential decays fit this very well. Uh, the different rise and decay times of the yellow curve versus the red and blue already hint at the different dynamics, which is what I said before, that it's related to lattice dynamics and not carriers. Um, and there's actually different time dynamics for electrons and holes, which is in fact also um, expected. We collaborate here on the theory with Sangeeta Sharma and, and team from uh, Max Born Institute that can do a real-time TDDFT um, calculations, including uh, lattice motion on the air and fast level. So some um, um, taking that into account and um, they can match uh, this, this behavior extremely well. We don't need it to the, for the interpretation of this. This is the beauty of the X-ray absorption measurement, but it allows us here to infer indeed uh, that the pi pi star changes are due to optical pumping. And the sigma star uh, is because of the nuclear motion that actually stabilizes uh, this, this kind of change. Don't forget, I'm plotting delta. So the changes relative to the unpumped case here. So what I show you here is the first measurement of real-time electron n-hole dynamics. We can directly infer the 200 milli electron uh, volt uh, n-doping, and this will be important a little later. And um, the fact, again, that I want to stress here is that we can measure electron n hole dynamics in real time, which is important for uh, carrier recombination dynamics if you think again about light harvesting. So can we now address these questions that I posed before that are open? And I show you here just with the symbolized Dirac cone, um, the two main processes that uh, people are discussing, um, which is um, impact excitation and energy heating. So this is basically what happens with the, with the carriers. Let's just discuss electrons here um, and what happens um, as function of time. And uh, these two processes are actually um, they are de detrimental opposite. For example, impact excitation is after optical pumping, if at the end you have more carriers than you started with. Um, however, their mean kinetic energy has decreased. You see this on the pink curve. So if I would look at the number of carriers from the measurement, I see over time they go up. And however, their mean kinetic energy goes down. So this would be nice if you are building a solar cell because you want carriers. The opposite is Auger heating, where the um, number of carriers goes down and the mean kinetic energy goes up. Let's see if we can infer that. So if we analyze our data, and I show you here the low fluence cases, in fact, for 800 nanometer pump, I, I show you the electrons and the holes in blue and in, in orange. And again, I show you here the oscillations overlaid in, in the dashed line is the period of the driving light field. So there are oscillations predominantly with this oscillation period, not exactly, but predominantly. And you see the rise of the incoherent background. So you see um, the coherence is basically the uh, polarization induced during the light field and uh, the, the de excitation into, well, the decrease of coherence that leads to the incoherent background, which is excitation of carriers. Um, and we, out of, out of the further measurements, we then uh, can um, extract the number of carriers and the mean kinetic energies. I know this graph is a little busy, but bear with me. If you, for example, look at the empty blue circles, you see as function of time that the number of uh, electrons goes up. The mean kinetic energies, which are these um, turquoise, magenta kind of, uh, uh, sorry, turquoise colors, we see they go down. So this is clearly impact excitation. And for holes, we see the same behavior. So we can say impact excitation dominates for both carrier types. This has not been measured in real time ever. 
and for 800 nanometers. So does this change if we change um, excitation photon energy? Well, let's pump with 1.8 microns at very similar photon energy. Again, you see now the oscillation periods has increased because the carrier uh, period has increased. Um, and if we analyze this, well, it looks a little more messy. Again, the, the blue empty circles number of electrons goes up. Number, uh, the mean kinetic energy of electron goes down. So that's the same as at 800 nanometers. If we now look at the holes, we see the number of holes um, increases. However, there seems to be a turnover. First, the uh, mean kinetic energies for the hole decreases and then rises. So there see, clear, seems to be a clear competition between the different carrier scattering processes, actually on ultra fast time scales. You see maybe within 10, 20 femtoseconds or so. And we can actually explain this uh, simply because if you remember that I said the materials end doped due to the limiting scattering phase space, which is asymmetric between um, electrons and holes. So it's, it's a nice method to actually infer this, um, this information um, directly from the measurement itself and without actually any use of theory. So can we say anything about the, um, the further um, transfer of energy between the um, carriers, between the electronic system and the nuclear system between the lattice? So again, look at the, look at the uh, measurement, the X-ray absorption measurement. So I, I recall again that the main um, de-excitation mechanisms that are being discussed is, is it a direct coupling of the light field um, due to the uh, Raman active um, phonon that you have, which occurs through intra-valley scattering? Or the other one is basically that uh, the light field displaces the potential between the excited and the ground states, and that leads actually um, also to some, um, at the end, to some in intervalley scattering and to excitation um, of phonons here, um, uh, which are scattered via the, um, via the gamma point. Well, this is by the, uh, the K point. Well, can we try to infer this? The problem again is if you do, for example, Raman spectroscopy, you, you will only be seeing the E2G phonon. You will be blind to the A1 prime. If you use, for example, electron scattering, you, might, you will see both on the incoherent background um, that you're measuring, but you will not necessarily have ultra fast time scales. So there are fantastic techniques out there, but again, you have to piece this information together. So can we extract this from um, our auto second actual absorption measurement? Well, if we look at our lineouts um, and we look at the, at the uh, pi star state, what we can do first is a simple three temperature model. This is basically a rate equation model that models the interaction between electrons um, strongly coupled optical phonons and acoustic phonons uh, as, as three coupled differential equations. This is typically done. Um, since they're rate equations, you have to be careful with this um, because they're dealing with temperatures. That means you are assuming uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. And certainly within the short time scales of the excitation at the beginning, we are absolutely not in thermal equilibrium but we're just reaching the, the limits of, of these kind of models. So if you use that model and you plug in the, um, uh, the heat capacities that are known for the material, you can fit actually the, uh, the electrons very well. So this is in blue. And I show you the three temperature model as dash line and a full blown um, um, uh, DFT uh, coupled molecular dynamic simulations for the material here actually in, in the solid line, which doesn't exactly match, but it, it describes um, the main dynamics, I would say. From that model then, without any further adjustment, you can uh, pull out directly the temporal dynamics of the strongly coupled optical phonons and of the acoustic phonons of the lattice. And from that, we, we can infer that the strongly coupled optical phonons actually are uh, responsible for funneling about 90% of the energy into the, into the phonon bath. So, Taking that and plotting then the, the orange lines here over the line out from the data directly, which is shown here. These are these oscillations. If you remember the, the, the empty uh, orange circles that I show you, you see that without any, any scaling in amplitude or so, 
that the scops that we pull out here from the left, from the three temperature model and from the molecular dynamic simulation matches extremely well, I would say um, identical, uh, the, strong, the time dynamics of the strongly coupled optical phonons until the um, acoustic phonons set in and maybe around 500 femtoseconds and take basically energy away from the strongly coupled optical phonons. So we, we can say that phonon phonon scattering in this case uh, becomes uh, dominant after about half a picoseconds. So can we learn more about this? Well, so we can take the sigma star signal that I showed you. So this is directly the X-ray absorption measurement and we can do a Gabor analysis. So a, a windowed uh, Fourier transform. So the price that we're paying is of course that we have to choose, uh, do we want high uh, frequency resolution or high temporal resolution? And you can do uh, a couple of these analysis. I'll show you the Nyquist limit on it. And what I get here is in fact, the phonon frequency uh, spectrum as function of time. So we have the full, full dispersion of the phonon dynamics for the first time. And um, if, I, if I just do um, basically a multi-peak fit on, on, the Fourier, on the total Fourier spectrum uh, that I show you here in, in, in black. So these are the, are the different uh, phonon modes that we can pull out. We, we can pull out uh, directly from the data, the SCOPs, the E2G and the A1 prime. And I can show, I can look at their uh, temporal evolution. Um, I can compare it with, uh, with some theory. So this is for example, the um, phonon um, uh, band structure um, for different electronic temperatures. So these are these different colored lines here. So you see how the, um, for the phonon band structure changes, for example, if you assume, assume that electrons have just room temperature or um, you know, initially at around 9,000 Kelvin, for example, again, we have to be careful at the first, uh, let's say couple 10 femtoseconds with um, thermodynamic measures, but it clearly shows you here that the frequency that we measure match uh, really with the E2G and A1 prime phonons. And, and I show you here their, their, their symmetries um, and then I show you the, uh, the acoustic phonons um, that are prominent typically in this material. Um, so from that, we can directly find out that both of the strongly coupled optical phonons that I show you up here in the graph appear very quickly, already after about 20 femtoseconds. So we can clearly not say phonons all hundreds of femtoseconds, this is where something happens and we can totally separate the electronic subsystem from the phononic one. Um, we can, of course, pull out a few more numbers and say that they maximize uh, nearly at the same time. And uh, the nice thing about this that I like to stress again, that we can have a holistic view over the whole thing. And we, we record also the non-Raman active one. Um, we measure them in real time. It matches very well with the, with the simulations. And uh, surprisingly, and this is a completely new finding also, is that the A1 prime phonon uh, despite not being Raman active, is responsible for 90% of the energy transfer to the phononic system. So uh, not as, as thought until now the E2G phonon. And, and again, I stress that this is of course interesting if you want to look at electronics, where does the energy go? How do you heat up the lattice? Where do you lose um, excitation? So with that, um, I, I come actually already to, to the end. I hope I can, I could um, inspire you a little bit. At least we're excited about using Atosec and X-ray spectroscopy. And I like to emphasize that we're trying to use it as it is being used by the X-ray community as core level spectroscopy, but with uh, the time resolution and with all the perks that the Atosec and technology brings as a powerful uh, new tool to give um, combined view on the fastest time scales, but not only, but also on the overarching time scales of the whole evolution of, of energy transfer. And um, since the X-ray method is actually not specific uh, um, only to looking at crystalline systems, there are lots of opportunities. And of course, lots of you and, and colleagues have fantastic work where they're trying to apply this to chemical problems or other problems in material science. So uh, just to wrap up, I've shown you how we make attosecond, the first attosecond isolated soft X-ray pulses. This is um, fully coherent soft X-ray radiation on a tabletop, some references here from the last couple of years. And then um, what I think are exciting um, um, 
new measurements on uh, time resolved core level spectroscopy, K shell spectroscopy, where we look at the overarching and real time view over the energy flow in this case of graphite. But uh, of course, it will be interesting to also apply it on other materials. Uh, very recently, we had published something that we measured actually years ago on titanium disulfide. And um, I'm very hopeful that through the source development and further development of methods and theory, uh, that this can be applied also soon to the oxygen edge and, and maybe also metallic or magnetic edges. Uh, last but not least, of course, I'm not doing this alone. Um, I have a fantastic group of people that was working hard on this and many other developments. I'd like to especially highlight for this uh, the work of um, Nicola Di Palo, um, Temisi Diropoulos, uh, Daniel Rivas, also Barbara Buades, um, Seth Kassin and others that were in the group, um, Michael Hemmer and so on. Um, great collaborators on experiment uh, at the Fritz Haber Institute. Um, also Fury from, uh, from Max Born Institute, uh, the MPI in Halle, um, the group in Kassel in Grenoble, and also uh, acknowledged samples from uh, Klaus Ropes group in Göttingen and funding. So. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Jens, for this great talk. Are there questions, comments? Please feel free to put them in the QA uh, tab. Otherwise, before we start, I would like to make an announcement. We have still the special issue associated with quantum aspects of auto science in European Physical Journal D. Deadline officially has passed, but we are still accepting post-deadline contributions. If you would like to contribute, drop me an email and, or let us know. Um, uh, Camilo saying, great talk, sorry, I have to leave. And uh, we had a lot of disruption due to the pandemic, but we are hopeful that it's going to be a great issue. So, we are accepting also tutorials and uh, we are also accepting uh, review articles. So do let us know if you would like to submit something. So are there questions, comments? Does anybody uh, would like to, would anybody like to ask something? So please raise your hand. Criticism, suggestions, anything. Everything, well. yes. Yes. Other material systems, ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's great to see the possibilities that you have uh, with this type of material, especially as far as solar cells are concerned and these kinds of things. In your opinion, what would be the greatest challenge there that is still to come? I think there are a few different challenges. I mean, we. Um, one of the, I mean, currently, I would say one of the um, one of the challenges for materials, if you want to look at them, is to find a balance between, I mean, from a measurement perspective on the measurement time and not disrupting the measurement itself. For example, if you go at um, too high repetition rate, um, I see Christian Ott there. He knows that very well. For example, on VO two correlated materials. Um, you, you have limitations on how much energy you deposit somewhere to, to pump the material and to generate a non-equilibrium condition. But I think this is something that we're just trying to learn, like uh, typical spectroscopy and, and not really a problem. I think um, in terms of, of the measurement itself, we are learning currently how to extract more information, not just about inter versus intraband dynamics, but for example, carrier scattering dynamics. You're no more, more like the metrics that material scientists are talking about. Uh, what are scattering times? What are scattering lengths? Uh, is there ballistic transport? These kind of things. And I think this, um, this is developing nicely in the field from theory. Also, I think there is spectacular development uh, from theorists. Um, I mean, I see uh, Michael, I see also Harvey Gross. Um, I mean, they are fantastic tools that are being developed um, to look at this. I think that's certainly a challenge, but the theory is needed to push this field further. It's not just experiment. I think in terms of light source development, it, it is a matter of uh, money and maybe a, um, a few years to, to push this reliably over the oxygen and the iron edges. But already, um, for example, this measurement took about six to eight hours, okay? 
And um, currently you, you can have better cameras, better spectrometers, for example, just the X-ray grating that we're using has a horrifically low efficiency of 2%. So we're throwing everything away at the very end. And you have now gratings that have efficiencies of 20%. So that's an order of magnitude change. So I think this is actually looking very good in terms of, um, and it's important that not just one or two groups do that. I, I'm really quite hopeful that the material science people see that this is a new tool in their arsenal that will not replace everything else, but that provides new insights. So I think there are a few challenges to the methodology, to the theory, um, and understanding materials, because most of us come from the from the laser corner or from the AMO corner, but I, I think this is uh, quite an interesting challenge. Thank you. We have another question from uh, Shubhadeep Biswas. Uh, do you see the possibility of this kind of measurement on 2D materials in the near future? Well, that's a good question, of course. So um, for the X-ray absorption, as we do it in transmission, um, you need enough absorption to get a signal. So the point is that we have measured down to something like 20 nanometers, but that's of course not a single layer. Um, I believe that there is a chance, but you might need a lot more photon flux. I don't see this as happening very quickly in transmission. You can measure in reflection, of course, but don't forget that if you measure in reflection, uh, you need to go under some small, maybe not bracing, but near bracing incidents. And then the limitations, in fact, are the sizes at which you typically get these to the materials. So if you're looking at graphene, that's not an issue. But if you're looking at anything a little more exotic, like what's currently hot in material science, these sometimes the sizes of these materials are maybe 50 micron, 100 micron. I don't, I see this as difficult and um, you would need uh, submicron focusing, which synchrotrons can do and maybe in some FELs, but um, it's, it's lossy optics that you have to use. So I think there is a challenge in that sense. Is that okay with you or would you like to pursue your question further? Yeah, it's fine, it's fine. So maybe just, I, I just wanted to ask one more question is like, uh, do you have plan to like uh, incorporate the photo emission spectroscopy with your absorption spectroscopy and can you get some more information about that? I mean, about the physics? You said photo emission, correct? Yes, yes, yes. Angle result photo emissions, for example. Yeah, I mean, so I, photo emission, um, the problem with this very broad, um, broadband pulses that you have that uh, in the soft X regime is that the initial state is not well defined typically. Yeah. It depends on what you do. So I see photo emission with this extremely broad uh, pulse as difficult. Um, of course, one could relax this. We certainly don't need 200 EV needle for the X-ray absorption measurement, nor photo emission. But of course, um, what might be more interesting is EELS measurement, so uh, basically electron scattering, which is uh, very related in information to the to the actual absorption. I see this as more promising, in fact. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, we have also Hardy Gross who has raised his hand. Hardy, feel free to to ask your question or make a comment. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Jens. Uh, this was a wonderful talk. Hello, Hardy. Um, I want to um, come to one statement that you made in the very beginning. Namely, you said uh, one cannot rely on separability between electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom like we have in, in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And um, I actually want to contest this statement. <laughs> So <laughs> there, there is an approach that we have developed over the last uh, uh, 10 years uh, that is known as exact factorization, mm -hmm. uh, which tells you that in fact, without approximation, there is a, a Schrödinger equation for the nuclei alone, which completely determines the, the, the nuclear dynamics. Now, the tricky aspect is that it is not a Born-Oppenheimer surface that governs the nuclear motion alone, but uh, uh, this surface, as opposed or as different from, from Born-Oppenheimer, is, is a potential that itself is time-dependent. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so, so the nuclear dynamics, and in particular, the, the time scale associated with the nuclear dynamics is on one hand intrinsic nuclear time scales, but in addition, there's this time scale on which the uh, uh, time dependent potential energy surface changes as a function of time. And this is determined by the electrons. Mm -hmm. And this, in, if you think of molecules, becomes relevant, let's say, in the vicinity of conical intersections in the traditional von Oppenheimer uh, picture. So you actually do have a separation of, of nuclear and, and electronic degrees of freedom. That's an exact statement. It's always like that. But it does not, uh, it, it actually allows you to disentangle the different time scales. Yeah, thank you for that comment. I mean, you, you're right about this. I'm, I'm wondering then if you're looking, um, so for graphite, you're saying that this could be treated then ab initio uh, correctly, as, as you're saying, right? On these yes, 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 yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but this is not what Sangeeta has, is, is using, correct? That's true. Yeah, that's a different approach. Yeah. Right, right. So, if, if I can ask one question back, if we're looking then, I mean, what would be interesting for me is um, where I think this is really nice is, for example, to look at mod materials or to look at things where, I mean, I alluded to it, uh, where cooperativity plays, plays a role, mm -hmm. right? Relations and so on. So do you see, this seems to be then one approach that, um, that might be able to attack this problem, no? Yes, absolutely. Yes, in fact, yes. It would be very interesting to look at this. Yes. Thank you for that comment. Okay. We, should be, we should be talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we have a chance to discuss off record as well, but uh, it is a great comment. Uh, yes. We have also a question now from Mohammed Abdel Rasul. Could you please comment on the phase matching conditions of high harmonic generation with? Uh, 12 bar of gas pressure. Also, if the laser beam is loosely focused and the interaction length is a few millimeters so that the generated harmonics would be absorbed as it propagates through the gas. Yes, okay, so um, thank you for that question. So um, let me see if I should go back here. Um, let's see, I'm trying to go somewhere, let's see. Okay. Maybe, maybe roughly there. Yeah. Okay, so um, phase matching. So one of the one of the not issues, but one of the challenges uh, was that when you go to this, so you need high number density to essentially mitigate wave packet diffusion. And uh, when you go to these high pressures, high number densities, um, you will have um, also you work under extremely high ionization conditions. And if you look at this, the coherence length is, is extremely short. It's just microns or tens of microns. So you actually do not want um, very, very long targets. Now, there was one paper in PNAS from uh, Margaret and Henry's group where they said basically lower pressures and, and long uh, targets are good. But if you look at that paper, they are talking about pressures, high pressures of one bar or so. And uh, they are talking about photon energies of maybe 100 or 150 or something EV. This is a little bit of a different regime. So we have we have published this in, in one of these, I think in the in the, in the nature com of uh, Stefan Teichmann and a follow up PRA where we show um, with simulations and measurements that the yield um, that we believe um, that we believe that the yield is much higher if you in fact make the targets as short as feasible compared to the coherence lengths. Now, the problem here is that um, how to confine gas within, let's say, a sheet of 100 microns or 200 microns um, under this high pressure. And that's, that's an exercise in fluid dynamics. And the solution for us had been, um, for example, the, the diameter of this little tube is around two millimeters. We, could, we have also some tubes of one millimeter and you drill um, a 200 micron hole. Now the transmission of the gas scales at the fourth power of the diameter. So it's basically an exercise in aspect ratio of diameter versus wall thickness. Otherwise you lose all the gas and you have too low density in here. And um, 
this is our arrangement. There are others that people are using, but this has allowed us to reach um, actually that high flux and enable these, uh, these kind of measurements. Um, and we are arriving at 12 bars. Another thing, if I can just add to that, is that, of course, you have to be ca um, careful because you will have reabsorption. Even if you have tens or 20 millibars of pressure over, let's say, 10 centimeter or somewhere. So you have to think about some differential pumping. The laser beam is relatively strongly focused for us, I would say, about 15 centimeters or so. Um, but we can reach this efficiency for that short pulse. Don't forget, we are driving this with a sub two cycle pulse. If you're driving this with a multi cycle pulse, um, the conditions are a little bit different. Okay, I, I hope that answers that question. Is that fine? Otherwise, uh, do feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, or, to, or to write me or something. I'm happy to answer. Yeah, he's happy. So, fine, thank you. We have another question from Samuel Plesnik. Do you think this technique could be extended to measure phase transitions in quantum gases like BEC? That's an interesting question. Um, let, let me say let me say first that I, I think it is um, absolutely feasible to try to look at phase transitions in solids. I just alluded to uh, mod physics and let's say uh, metal insulator transitions or something like that, or uh, maybe even a topological phase transition, but uh, we have to see about signal to noise. On a BEC, I know that there are people in, in Hamburg, I think, that are trying to do strong field physics with, um, with BEC. And I'm not so sure. Um, I mean, strong field and BEC looks to me always a little bit incompatible or interesting uh, because the interactions. So um, I don't want to say anything negative about it. I'm curious. I think it depends on if you, I guess you will probably disturb the, the BEC. I'm just thinking loudly here. And then the question is, um, how do you acquire the information um, in, a, in a sensible way? But a priori, uh, nobody prevents you from sending your X-ray beam on, on a BEC and measuring something in reflection or transmission. I mean, from a conceptual point of view, I think you can certainly combine this. From a physics point of view, I guess you have to ask yourself how much energy you do deposit into this and what it means for the, uh, you know, for the coherent state and how you might disturb it. I don't know if Carla, you know more about this or anybody else wants to comment. Sorry, yeah. I, I don't think I can give a, a more precise answer. If anybody would like to say something, feel free to raise your hand. We have quite a broad audience and uh, it would be great to hear from you what you think. I don't see anyone raising the hand. So Nobody, nobody's working on the BC. <laughs> I don't know, maybe they are, but they're not around or they are on YouTube. Uh, we're still going to have the chance uh, to have a chat which is a bit more off record. So for those who are a bit shy, just hang in there. We're going to end our YouTube transmission fairly soon. So for those who are on YouTube, thank you so much for watching and supporting the initiative. Take good care of yourselves, stay safe, have a great weekend and hope to see you next week, okay? So take care.